Welcome to everybody. Honorable Minister of State for Human Resource Development, Dr. Shachi Tharoor, Mrs. Ratan Kaul, Vice President, ICUNR, Mr. K.L. Malhotra, General Secretary, ICUNR, Ms. Aditi Luthra, Director of Programs, also at ICUNR, my UN colleagues, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2013 UN Day Lecture Discussion on the theme UN 2.0, the peacemaker in need of a pacemaker? To be honest, when I saw the words UN and pacemaker together, my heart skipped a beat. <laughs> what is being suggested here? I thought to myself, surely it can't be that this organization is in such dire straits. Are we going to see a round of UN bashing, a solid condemnation of its failures, followed by a pronouncement of its irrelevance and eventual demise? Then I realized that a measured and thoughtful speaker like Shashi Tharoor would hardly <coughs> resort to generalizations and abstract prophecies of doom. We all know Dr. Tharoor as a consummate speaker, someone whose thoughts flow with uncanny precision and who is able to connect with and convert if I may say so, the doubters, the fence-sitters, and the cynics. I think he is all this and much more. Shashi, from what I know of him, is a true UN believer. And while we must wait to hear about his diagnosis of the UN, I know that he believes passionately in the values of the organization. Peace, development, human rights. These have been more than just buzzwords for him. His work has encompassed all three. So Shashi, welcome to this UN Day lecture. And since we are all here to mark UN Day, let me first read to you the message of the UN Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. I quote, United Nations Day is a chance to recognize how much this invaluable organization contributes to peace and common progress. It is a time to reflect on what more we can do to realize our vision for a better world. The fighting in Syria is our biggest security challenge. Millions of people depend on UN humanitarian personnel for life-saving assistance. UN experts are working hand in hand with Nobel Peace Prize winning organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons to destroy Syria's stockpiles. And we are pushing for a diplomatic solution to end suffering that has gone on far too long. Our most urgent development challenge is to make sustainability a reality. The Millennium Development Goals have cut poverty in half. Now, we must maintain the momentum, craft an equally inspiring post-2015 development agenda, and reach an agreement on climate change. This year again, we saw the United Nations come together on armed conflict, human rights, the environment, and many other issues. We continue to show what collective action can do. We can do even more. In a world that is more connected, we must be more united. On United Nations Day, let us pledge to live up to our, fourth, to our founding ideals and work together for peace, development, and human rights. End of Secretary General's message. Thank you. Shashi, without further ado, let me hand over to you. You have the floor. <laughs> All right, well, Sorry. my dear friend Kiran, uh, whom I've known for more years than I think either of us wants to admit. Uh, <laughs> distinguished guests, Mr. Malhotra, Ratan Kaul, Aditi Lutra, uh, and, and the excellencies in the audience, as well as the equally excellent non-excellencies behind them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, I hope that covers everybody anyway. Thank you. Um, as we celebrate United Nations Day three days in advance, I thank the Indian Council for United Nations Relations and the United Nations Information Center for again giving me this opportunity to participate in today's deliberations aimed at infusing new energy and relevance into the UN. I've been complaining slightly to them that last year too I delivered the equivalent lecture and now it's time we find another willing victim for the next time around. But I know that given my long years of association with the UN, which 
29 years uh, as a UN staffer, I'm still often seen as being the UN's man in India, so I get wheeled out when these occasions uh, require it. But indeed, I've been fortunate in many ways. Excuse me, sir, those cameramen up se shikayat kar rahe uh, indeed, um, I've been fortunate in being part of the UN through some of the most tumultuous periods of its history. While my years there provided me with the insight into the workings of the UN system, my years away from the UN as a public representative and now a minister have added a, a different set of nuances to my understanding of the UN. Um, the UN, as you all know, was established in the aftermath of the Second World War. And uh, one of its prime objectives was uh, to achieve lasting and pervasive global peace. Uh, I would add that, in fact, it was established technically during the Second World War because though the uh, media called them the Allies, they were formerly the United Nations after 1943, the victorious powers of the war. And they converted their wartime alliance into a peacetime organization in San Francisco uh, after the war. Now, the goalposts for the United Nations are therefore noble, tall, and ever-expanding. The UN's journey to match the stated objective with as much zeal and honesty is not completely devoid of awkward missteps and a few stumbles. But um, this obituary writing for the UN seems to have become too much of a popular exercise with the recent uh, contestation over its role in the Syrian crisis, and before that in its response to the Arab Spring, 2011, the Iraq War in 2003, to mention just a few recent flashpoints in its turbulent history. Now, I worked for nearly, nearly three decades at the UN uh, to contribute to multilateral cooperation, and these institutional obituaries are exasperating uh, to me as they are to many others. Uh, I remember after the Iraq crisis, or during the Iraq crisis, in fact, some evoked a parallel to the League of Nations a body created with great hopes at the end of the First World War, which was reduced to debating the standardization of European railway gauges the day the Germans marched into Poland. But despite um, such enthusiastic and often critical concerns, I firmly believe that the UN is as relevant to the world of today as it was in 1945. In fact, as the problems plaguing the world develop uh, even greater uh, complexity, the UN's role is going to be even more critical in the coming decades. Now, at the same time, I believe this great institution needs renewed rigor and relevance to stay true to its objectives. At 68 today, it's well beyond the age of retirement, except perhaps in some European capitals, I don't know, but I would argue that the institution needs reform rather than retirement. But before we craft or discuss lofty ideas of reforms, we must um, visit the big question. Does the UN have a future? And perhaps to answer that, we need to ask another more relevant question. Has the UN been effective and relevant in the past? Now, as it happens with an individual's journey or with the, human, with the history of human evolution, the answer to questions about the future often lies in, in past conquests and past surrenders. You know, it's often true that the driving uh, that to, to drive forward effectively, you do need to look at the rear view mirror from time to time, and we should probably do that today. The leaders of the coalition that had won the war um, were determined to make the second half of the 20th century different from the most, much troubled first half. So the United Nations established, um, we now speak of global governance, the phrase wasn't used at that time, but the idea was very much to create an international architecture that would foster global cooperation, elaborate consensual global norms, and establish predictable, universally applicable rules for the benefit of all, as an alternative to the military alliances and the balance of power politics that had wreaked such havoc in the first four decades of the 20th century. So the UN found staunch advocates and great visionaries in the event eventful decade of the 1940s, people like former US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who stated in his historic speech to the two US Houses of Congress after the Yalta Conference that the UN would be the alternative to the arms races, military alliance, balance of power politics, and all the arrangements, he said, that had led to war so often in the past. He wanted the UN to stand for a world in which people of different nations and cultures 
would look on each other not as subjects of fear and suspicion, but as potential partners able to exchange goods and ideas to their mutual benefit. A place where small and big states would be able to work as sovereign equals, pursuing common objectives in a universal forum. In fact, as the UN was established, President Harry Truman I said in his speech, as you know, FDR died just before the San Francisco conference. And Harry Truman represented America, and he said, you have created, at the end of the signing of the chart, he said, you have created a great instrument for peace and security and human progress in the world. This was a speech he made on June 26, 1945. If we fail to use it, he said, we shall betray all those who have died in order that we might meet here in freedom and safety to create it. If we seek to use it selfishly for the advantage of any one nation or any small group of nations, we shall be equally guilty of that betrayal. And that was a, an extraordinary uh, statement of idealistic commitment to the internationalism uh, of the spirit of that particular age. And then he went on, and, and the philosophy of world, world peace, one of the primary objectives of the UN, uh, is reflected in these words. Um, he said, we all have to recognize, no matter how great our strength, that we must deny ourselves the license to do always as we please. No one nation can or should expect any special privilege which harms any other nation. Unless we are all willing to pay that price, no organization for world peace can accomplish its purpose. And what a reasonable price that is. It's difficult to imagine an American president using such words today, but it's worth recalling that that was the spirit in which the UN was founded. The first two peacekeeping missions were the UN True Supervision Organization, UNSO, in 1948, and the UN Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan in 1949, uh, both uh, addressing problems that are still with us today, the Israel-Palestine and the India-Pakistan crises, respectively. But with, the, with that, at that point, still no troops involved but observers, um, the UN established itself as the global peacemaker. And then, of course, Suez and so on became the next major departure. We'll come to that. Now, the UN, since then, one would argue, has actually achieved much more than it set out to do. Now, if you look at the Charter, the Charter was very much a military alliance writing itself uh, a job in, in peacetime. So you have Chapter 7, which is, envisages a staff committee of the five commanders of the armed forces of the permanent members, and they would sit down together, and all members would have to contribute under the charter land, sea, and air forces to the UN, and the UN would then use them to maintain peace around the world. Totally unrealistic, uh, and essentially became unfunctional immediately after the war because of the Cold War. But even then, when I joined the UN in 1978, if I had told the seniors of the organization I was just joining that one day the UN would uh, observe and run elections in sovereign states, that the UN would conduct intrusive inspections for weapons of mass destruction, that it would impose comprehensive sanctions on the entire import-export trade of a member state, that it would set up international criminal tribunals and essentially coerce governments into handing over their citizens to be tried by foreigners under international law for crimes against their own people. If I had said the UN would administer territory, conduct large multidimensional peacekeeping operations, putting in more than 100,000 soldiers into the field at one time, that the UN would deploy human rights monitors to report on the behavior of sovereign governments, if I had suggested any of those things to my seniors, since this is the late 1970s, they'd have probably turned to me and said, you don't understand anything about the UN. Young man, what have you been smoking? But in fact, every single one of those things has been done by the UN since 1978. Indeed, it's been done uh, in response to ongoing situations around the world. It was in inconceivable in the 70s to imagine the UN in its current version of this 2.0 role of establishing world peace, which has evolved with practice. We cannot, could not then think that the UN would take sides between democracy and dictatorship, seek to intervene in the internal affairs of its members, advocate safeguarding human rights across the globe. However, during the years that the UN uh, has done all this, it's done more than any single organization to promote and strengthen democratic institutions and practices around the world. India, by the way, is a leading donor still, and for a while it was the joint number one donor to the UN's Democracy Fund, which provides assistance for building democracy around the world. Uh, the UN established a peace-building commission to help countries transition from war to durable peace, with the support 
of many developing countries. And in the past two decades, or two and a half decades, I'd say, if we could count back, more civil wars have ended through mediation than in the previous two centuries combined in the world. More than 170 UN-assisted peace settlements have ended regional conflicts. Such a feat has been possible because the UN provided leadership, opportunities for negotiation, strategic coordination, and the resources to implement peace agreements. In addition, more than 300 international treaties have been negotiated at the UN, setting an international framework that reduces the prospect for conflict amongst member states. The UN has unparalleled experience, leadership, and authority in coordinating humanitarian action, whether it's tsunamis or human waves of refugees. When the blue flag flies over a disaster zone, all know that humanity is taking responsibility, not any one government, and that when the UN succeeds in handling the problem, the whole world wins. The UN's newly established, and not so new anymore, revolving fund for emergency response to humanitarian disasters reflects and strengthens its ability to make a difference. Um, so these are all achievements that the UN can meaningfully build on. And so when we have in this title that Ratan and Aditi came up with, uh, the role of a peacemaker, I think the UN has earned that term. Its contribution is largely unblemished with respect to impact, efficacy, rigor. And currently, there are 16 peacekeeping operations active in four continents on a budget of, I say this almost with envy, thinking of the numbers I had to deal with, 7.23 billion US dollars. Since 1948, 68 peacekeeping operations have been deployed, and 55 of those since 1988. I, I came into the peacekeeping stream for having worked in refugees in 89, so I was present at the creation of very many of them. Yes, there have been instances when the peacekeeping efforts of the UN were not completely successful. Uh, the older testimonies exist in the form of, of course, the Israel, Palestine, and India, Pakistan issues. Uh, the peacekeeping efforts also faltered in some places, uh, Nigeria during the Biafran War. Cambodia, I would say, um, we had some difficulties, but then in the end it worked out all right. Uh, Sri Lanka, uh, we, we, we actually ended up uh, leaving it to the Norwegians to do the bulk of the negotiating there. Um, Congo, uh, where we have a, a peacekeeping force that uh, kept something of the peace but could not entirely prevent continued killing. Uh, Bosnia, of course, we can talk about during the Q&A. Uh, Rwanda, uh, where the genocide took place despite the presence of UN peacekeepers sent for a different purpose, and I can explain that if you ask. Uh, Sudan, and of course now Syria. So um, the ever-expanding goalpost goal of expectations has moved with greater speed than perhaps the ability and the achievements of this great institution. Um, world peace is now not only threatened by the traditional dangers, but also by more complex developments. The ever-increasing cyber threat, for example, expanding food security problems, changing governance regimes, fighting or potential conflict over natural resources, including water, adoption of chemical weapons uh, by some countries, the increasing threat of pandemics, which is also a security threat, rising regional tensions, abject poverty, and sophisticated terrorism. All of these have contributed a more acute and complex set of threats to the maintenance of world peace. As the nature of these problems have changed, so have the epicenter of the UN's approaches. The conflicts of the 1940s were largely in what we today call the Western world. Uh, the current list of concerns mainly in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa, West Asia and Africa. Uh, the shift in epicenter implies some tectonic shifts. So the question arises of whether the UN has undergone changes of similar magnitude to acquire the relevance, resources, and authority to tackle these shifts. Now, for some years now, there's been a dichotomy the world is facing. It was well reflected in a book by Robert Kagan called Of Paradise and Power, in which he suggested that the elemental issue in world affairs today is the incompatibility of the American and so-called European diagnoses of our contemporary geopolitical condition. So in Kagan's view, the US sees a Hobbesian world rife with menace and disorder that requires the imposition of order and stability by a Leviathan. While Europe and much of the rest of the world imagines a sort of Kantian world of peace and rationality, 
which can be minded by, managed by reasonable-minded leaders coming to sensible arrangements through institutions like the United Nations and no doubt speaking French while doing so. Uh, so some quarters um, uh, say the answer lies in disregarding the United Nations and as Professor Michael Glennon argued in Foreign Affairs magazine, restoring might to its rightful place in international affairs. Now, there are many flaws in this argument, but the key one lies in its central premise. For the United Nations was not created by starry-eyed Kantians. It was established as a response to a Hobbesian world. Instead of a Leviathan, though, it imagined an effective international system run by both the strong and the small, a partnership between Gulliver and the Lilliputians. To make this work, it is imperative that we pay heed to the call for reform. And that's what would give a pacemaker uh, to the peacemaker. Inarguably, reform is a term that means different things to different people. You know, it's rather like Englishmen talking about the weather. And everyone speaks about reform, and no one's willing to do anything about it. That's usually the case when people discuss the weather. Uh, any change a country wants in the UN is labeled reform. Uh, it sometimes conveniently garbs self-interest in the cloak of institutional progress. Um, but the recent history say the last decade of uh, debates about UN reform uh, would go back to the uh, Iraq war of, uh, of uh, 2003. In the summer of 2003, a poll was conducted by the Pew Organization in the States. 20 countries around the world they conducted, and they revealed that the UN standing had gone down in all 20 countries. The reason for disgruntlement in the US was that the UN did not give its assent to Washington's plans for a war on Iraq. And the reason the UN went down in the 19 other countries is because those countries didn't want the UN to go to war in Iraq and were unhappy that they allowed the US to do so. So I would argue that you know, if you're making everybody unhappy, you're probably doing something right. Uh, and the UN needs reform not because it has failed, but because it has succeeded enough to be worth renewing. So it's imperative we continue to invest in the global experiment, uh, which in many ways is set out to, to has achieved more than it set out to do. Uh, but the benchmarks for its future performance have swelled uh, as the situation in the world has evolved. But the important way to see the UN, it seems to me, is that you must realize it's both a stage and an actor. It's a stage, uh, a platform on which different member states come in and negotiate their differences. And then it's an actor in the form of the Secretary General, the peacekeeping operations, the UN agencies that go out and implement what the actors on the stage have agreed to. So blaming the UN for failing to uh, prevent genocide in Rwanda or Darfur or whatever, uh, even Syria today overlooks the real question, who or what is the UN? So one can argue that if the member states have not been able to agree on giving the UN, if in other words the stage has not agreed on giving the actor the mandate to end the killing, there's no point blaming the actor. You have to look at what happened on the stage. In fact, uh, the problem is a lot of this criticism about the UN often uh, sees the UN as a blind scapegoat for the failures of its member states. My old boss, Kofi Annan, often used to joke that the acronym by which we all called him at the UN, SG, actually was short for scapegoat, he would say. <laughs> in fact, you know, in the old days of the British medieval court, they used to have a, had a playmate for the Prince of Wales always, you know. And this fellow was usually from a poor family, was kept in the palace, given the best of food and drink and clothes and comforts and so on. But every time the prince made a mistake, this fellow was brought out and flogged because you couldn't punish the prince, you see. So he was called the whipping boy. That's where the expression the whipping boy comes from. But, but you see, the problem is that's what's happened to the UN. You can't blame the big powerful member states for things they don't do. So you blame the UN. The UN didn't do it. And they flog it. But if you want to keep flogging the whipping boy, you've got to be careful not to flog it to death because then you won't have anyone left to flog. Now, reforms, of course, are a process and not a standalone event. There's a case for reviewing and reviving the entire architecture of the international system that had been built up since 1945 in order to construct a more effective house of global governance for the 21st century. But change in the UN comes mainly as adaptation and not as legislative fiat. The perennial saga of Security Council reform, the open-ended working group of the General Assembly, was set up in 1992. That's pretty open-ended, isn't it? <laughs> Some of us have called it the never-ending talking group rather than the open-ended working group because they still haven't come up with a formula that everybody can sign on to. But you know, they speak a lot of languages of the UN, and my Chinese friends there told me that in their language, the Chinese character 
for crisis is actually made up of two other characters, the character for danger and the character for opportunity. So if you see a crisis at the UN and you think Chinese for a minute, it actually represents a tremendous opportunity. And certainly under Kofi Annan, I would argue, the UN saw the danger and seized the opportunity at that time. And the Annan reform proposals still look pretty good to me. Uh, he got a couple of eminent panels of experts uh, on both the development agenda and on the security agenda, came up with some very useful suggestions. Um, uh, world leaders signed on to them. A lot of them can still be effectively implemented, but again, member states have to agree. Um, and, you know, we think in terms of Iraq, Syria, conflict, and so on, but the tragic confluence of AIDS, famine, and drought in parts of Africa probably threaten more human lives than Iraq and Syria combined, right? Uh, the crisis in Middle Eastern nations, um, uh, tensions over the nuclear capabilities of North Korea, I mean, there's no shortage of examples you can find of problems where you need international approaches effectively. Uh, terrorism. I mean, okay, and the UN, for the first time in the early 2000s, you actually had a clear and unequivocal agreed language to condemn uh, terrorism in all its forms and manifestations committed by whomever, wherever, and for whatever purposes, quote, unquote. That was actually a breakthrough because there had been long and tortuous negotiations uh, that preceded it. But greater cooperation between the international policing agencies, that doesn't happen at the UN, that happens elsewhere. Intelligence inputs, again, not at the UN, but bilaterally between countries, advanced preparedness. All of that should be happening, but it has to be aided by a political consensus at the United Nations uh, to handle terrorism uh, effectively. Uh, if, for example, we were to take seriously the requirements in uh, Security Council Resolution 1373, which being under Chapter 7 is a binding resolution that obliges member states to report um, their actions in terms of compliance with terror, and obliges them to say what they have done to prevent and interdict the flow of funds to terrorists, the flow of arms to terrorists, the movements of terrorists. Imagine if, for example, our friends across the border in Pakistan were asked to report credibly uh, on, on their cooperation with Resolution 1373. We might actually get some serious international attention to the ways in which uh, the UN can be an effective instrument for tackling this real problem. The uh, demand for reforms in the UN is as wide-ranging as its operations, reforms in the democracy promotion and financing, UN Secretary Transparency, Security Council reform, human rights reform, etc. Um, there are major dimensions to all of this. Making democracy a priority is, in my view, increasingly important. Bolstering and strengthening the ranks of the staff of the United Nations, prioritizing their work, streamlining, healing wounds. Um, the um, uh, the, the reform in the ranks of the UN. There's some of us here who are survivors from there. I see the old deputy military advisor just spotted him, Moni Bhagat from India, who was, who was there at the time. We've, we've seen the UN functioning um, uh, for some time. And, and of course, uh, uh, having left the UN and come back to India, I get too often the same question about when we're going to become a permanent member of the Security Council. And I usually say to people, um, uh, not just yet, you know, one day it will happen, but not this year and probably not next year. Now I can say to them, buy my book, Pax Indica, there's a whole chapter <laughs> on it, you know. But, um, but it's in many ways, reform of the Security Council is rather akin to a malady in which a whole bunch of doctors gather around a patient and they all agree on the diagnosis, but they can't agree on the prescription. And that's essentially what's happening right now with the UN. Um, I, I can talk about it in greater detail, but... Uh, I'm already running late, and I wanted to give you time for two or three questions, so let me skip that vexed subject. You already, all of you have heard so much about it. Uh, let, me, let me move on. Um, so, um, in any case, ideally the topic of UN reform should not be confined, as it is in India, to just Security Council reform. We need to embrace the functioning of the Council, the functioning of the General Assembly, the Economic and Social Council, the Human Rights Council, to name a number of organs of the world body. Um, but one thing that one has to talk about, of course, is that um, whether it's a question of who gets into the Security Council or not, uh, there is still an intractable issue as to what to do about the log jams in the Security Council when one or two of the permanent members disagree with the rest. On the Iraq war, it was the US and the UK that were out of sync with the majority uh, opinion. On Syria today, it's Russia and China 
<clears throat> just this weekend, Saudi Arabia, in an unprecedented move, rejected the seat that it had just been elected to as a non-permanent member of the Security Council because it felt that the Council was unable to agree on decisive actions on Syria. The fact is the Charter was written at a time when concordance amongst the permanent members was assumed to exist, and we all know it didn't. When it does not, either creative solutions have to be found by the Secretary General, as Hammarskjöld did by inventing peacekeeping, essentially, to overcome the Cold War stalemate between the West and the Soviet Union, or countries have to assume their individual responsibilities. The UN can only reflect agreement. When there is disagreement, it cannot act effectively. So, um, yes, one can argue that the peacemaker needs a pacemaker, and that the pacemaker, the heart of it, is still the Security Council. We need to try and get it to be more effective. But we should calibrate our expectations in terms of what is realistic. <coughs> I have no doubt that if reform is unduly delayed, the result could be a UN dramatically diminished by a decision of some of its most important members to ignore or neglect it. I mean, countries that repeatedly don't find a place at the high table will move away from that high table. I think the Saudi decision is a very interesting one in that respect. Um, and of course, other bodies could well arrogate political responsibilities to themselves to the, at the expense of the, the UN Security Council, and that'll be a loss for the world as a whole which at least today has a universal organization to hold it together under the rules of international law. Um, but to seek a perfection in the UN that is absent in other forms of human endeavor is itself unrealistic. As the UN's uh, great Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld put it, the UN was not created to take mankind to heaven, but rather to save humanity from hell. Sometimes the best the UN can do is prevent things from getting worse. It can't necessarily wave a wand and give you paradise on earth or find the perfect solution. And that is something we all have to recognize. Uh, the UN is a mirror of the world. It reflects our agreements, our disagreements. Um, but still, as a reconciler of world conflicts, it perhaps needs to be inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, uh, his famous line, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. If the UN wants to change the world. It should be the change a little way as well. Now. I see the UN as, a, uh, as an international organization with its feet standing firmly on its unparalleled achievements, its eyes set on a future course, and its mind engaged in transforming itself in the light of changing circumstances. I imagine a refurbished UN built on the strong foundations that I've already summarized for you earlier, reinforced by the innovations and achievements of the last 68 years, and renovated to take account of the problems that lie ahead. Uh, the UN must continue to lead the way in its areas of expertise. As I said earlier, foremost agency in coordinating response to humanitarian disasters. I think the most successful practitioner to negotiate and monitor peace treaties, conduct peacekeeping operations. But I think it's not the right body to lead uh, military interventions. Uh, peacekeeping is one thing, but peace enforcement is not something the UN is really able to do though its legislative bodies will undoubtedly remain the primary source of legitimacy for any such interventions. No other agency can replace the UN in tackling the surviving issues of the last century, along with the newly emerging international issues from cyberspace to, uh, to outer space, with the legitimacy and the objectivity of the UN itself. The UN will continue in many ways to be a leveling ground where the rich and the powerful commit their might and their resources to the developing and underdeveloped nations, and a forum in which the voice of the weak is heard as loudly as the roar of the strong. That is what the UN's great strength, and we should have that there. So much for the architecture. But as the old saying goes, a house is not a home. Something more, something extremely important, though not quite so tangible, is needed before we can be happy that the UN is all it can be in the 21st century. And that is that the new UN must encapsulate the 21st century's equivalent of the spirit that informed its founding. Once we have that, the house becomes a home. Our new UN must never lose sight of the problems facing the vast majority of humanity. It must remain true to the we the peoples in whose name the UN Charter was signed. That, I think, would be the way forward for this organization whose birthday we will all celebrate on Thursday. Thank you very much for listening to me in Jeff. Thank you so much, Dr. Tharoon. I now invite